Hello and welcome to part four of the ESAM webinar series. My name is Alex Howard and I'm a part of the SARDI research team that performs regular analysis of the national ESAM data to prepare monthly reports for red meat establishments, MLA and the Department of Agriculture. In this video, I'll be going through some real establishment E. coli 0157 and STEC monitoring reports. So why is STEC testing conducted on Australian exported beef products? Well, in 1993, there was a large outbreak of foodborne illness in the United States, which was attributed to undercooked hamburgers served at the fast food chain Jack in the Box. 732 people were affected, with 171 hospitalised, many of which who were left with permanent injuries, and four young children died. The bacterium found to be to be the cause of the infections was E. coli 0157, a serotype of the Shiga toxin producing E. coli. And while this bacterium had caused illness previously, the size and severity of the outbreak, the involvement of children and the link with the iconic American hamburger made this outbreak a landmark event in the history of food safety. Now in the aftermath, although no links were drawn with Australian beef, US food safety practices were overhauled and Australian ground beef exporters were slapped with additional testing requirements. First for E. coli 0157 in 1997 and then in 2012 for the other big six non-0157 STECs. Now STECs are rarely detected in Australian beef products. As we can see here, we have three years, the past three years of national STEC data and over 71,000 tests have been conducted with only 237 returning as confirmed positives. So very low prevalence there. But it is very important that we maintain our onshore testing as there are huge market access implications for positive port of entry detections. Now testing is required for raw ground beef components. And that includes all beef and veal bulk packed manufacturing trimmings and other beef and veal components such as primal cuts, subprimal cuts, head meat, cheek meat, esophagus meat and advanced meat recovery product that is intended for export to the USA or Canada. Now what is unique about this testing requirement is that the product must be able to be recalled until the result of testing is known to be negative. Now STEC testing is performed at what's called an N equals 60 sampling rate. Now what this means is that uh, the collected samples must comprise of at least 60 subsamples, so 60 small pieces of meat within a lot that are selected from a minimum of 12 cartons uh, and with a minimum of five samples taken from each carton. Now testing methods are not simple or easy to perform. There's two stages of testing required to confirm a positive result. So you have a screening test which looks for specific genetic targets within a sample that are associated with 0157 and non 0157 STEX. And then you also have a confirmation test, which is required to ensure that these genetic targets originated from at least one STEC isolate. So in this presentation, we're gonna go through an example of an establishment E. coli 0157 and STEC monitoring report. Now what we've got in there is uh, some E. coli 0157 and STEC prevalence summaries. Also some time plots of E. coli 0157 and STEC confirmed detections and some screening and confirmation test results. Um, and in addition to that, we're also gonna have a look at some national STEC data just to see what trends are occurring nationally. So here we have a table which shows our E. coli 0157 and STEC prevalence summary. And this is both from on-plant and DA verification tests. So the two different sources of on-plant testing. And we can see that this establishment has got a, a really solid uh, track record in terms of their E. coli 0157 and STEC testing. So out of over 1,236 tests, they've only had one confirmation within the last three years. That's a prevalence of 0.08%. Now, if we take a look nationally over that time period, we've got over 71,000 tests here and only 237 uh, total confirmations. Um, so a little bit higher prevalence, but that's still very, very low. And we can see here that the two most commonly detected STEC serovars are our 0157 and 
O26. Now this table shows our E. coli O157 and STEC prevalence summaries from just the DA verification tests. And at this establishment, we can see over the last three years, there's been no confirmed or um, detections for STECs that have occurred from DA verification tests. Now nationally over the same period, there's been a few here. And again, the two most common serotypes are O157 and O26, um, but very few still coming through there. These, these prevalence figures are very low. This plot here is a time plot uh, for the, con the confirmed detections of E. coli O157 for this establishment and for all establishments over the last three years. So the blue dots indicate there were no detections that occurred and the red dots indicate positive detections, confirmed positive detections. And we can see here that one detection that we've had at our plant here has occurred here. Um, but apart from that, they've got a, a really clean sheet there. Um, if we look at the national data, you know, while on the surface, it looks like there's a lot of detections coming here. But this is actually around about 127 detections for O157, but that's out of 71,000 tests. So the prevalence is actually less than 0.2%. So when you put it into context, there's very low number of positive detections for O157 that occur nationally in Australia. Now, following on from that, this is another series of plots that are showing our all of our non O157 STEC confirmed detections that have occurred nationally over the last three years. So these are the big six STEC. You have your um, O26, O45, 103, 121, 111, and 145. And we can see, apart from O157, O26 is our other most commonly occurring uh, STEC serotype. So that's the one that we keep an eye out for. Looking at trends here, it's very difficult to pick that up because there's so few detections. They tend to occur in clusters, if at all. But again, it's very difficult to predict, even from national data. You know, this is, this is again over 71,000 tests and we're still getting a very small picture of, of what's going on there because there's, there's no detections, which is a really good sign for um, Australian red meat. So this table here is showing us our screening test results and confirmation test results. So we can see that at this plant, um, we've actually had eight screening tests that returned a potential positive. And then six of those were confirmed as negative and only one was confirmed through as a positive detection for E. coli O157. And this emphasizes that low conversion rate from potential positive to confirmed positive. You know, the testing is not perfect there. So this table here um, is a bit of a graphical tool which highlights the different months throughout the last year of testing where clusters of potential and confirmed positives for O157 and other STECs have occurred um, at this specific establishment. Now, it's a bit difficult to see what, what happens here with the color coding because obviously this plant has only had one confirmed detection over the last year. Um, but when we go on to the next plot, which will be of national data, here you can see it's the same summary table, um, but you can see it much more clearly. So the color is weighted with regards to how many potential positives and confirmed positive tests are returned. And you can see here that conversion rate from screening to confirmation tests does vary a little. So like here we had 33 potential positives nationally within the month of March 2017, and only 10 of them went through as confirmed. Um, so that's about one in three. Then here we've got 17 for June, got 17 potential positives, and only two went through and were confirmed. So it's really difficult to judge, but there is a bit of a barrier in terms of the screening test and then following through to the confirmation. It's, it's a bit of a sort of a gamble. So that's going to conclude the ESAM webinar series. If you would like to know more about the ESAM analysis reporting service, please check out part one to three of the ESAM webinar series, which is now available. We also have a written explanatory guide for ESAM reports that's available via email. So get in touch with us at Sardi Food Safety and Innovation. Um, we'd love to hear from you.
Thank you for joining me. I hope you found this useful in interpreting your ESAM reports.